Here's a few more comments about the mean value theorem to try and make it clear why this is really useful, what it's all about. Some of the problems, like in my mean value theorem 2 video, are kind of, uh, kind of fake because they ask you to sort of focus on one particular value of a derivative. Um, and it's usually much more about inequalities that the mean value theorem is useful. So let's just look what the MVT says and then see some corollaries of it that are, that are better uh, for most purposes. Okay, so it says if f is continuous and differentiable on the appropriate intervals, and I'm not going to focus on that too much, um, then there is, you can look up the uh, more precise statement in the book or in the other videos, there is a C with f prime of C equal to the secant slope between A and B. Okay, so this is not the form in which it's most useful. So let me give you a, uh, a corollary here. Suppose that we know that f prime of c, the slope, is known. It's not known precisely. If it was known precisely to always be the same number, then it would be a straight line. What, is a, what if it's known to be within some bounds? Like, let's say it's with, between like n and m. And these are just some known numbers. Well, that should mean that it's the slope is at least n and less than m. Let's say this is like uh, 1 half and this is 2. So it would be somewhere between these. You can't wiggle too much. You can't turn around. You can't get flat. You can't go too steep. That has something to do with the values this function can have. So let's see. Another way to think about it is in terms of speed. So if I re rewrite that assumption, let's say n is less than or equal to f prime of x, less than or equal to m. Let's say on some interval. That could be, it could be everywhere. It could just be on some interval. So for example, uh, if I have like s prime of t, that's the velocity. Instead of some random function f of x, let's think about velocity. Suppose that. Oh, suppose that's like between 55 miles per hour and 75 miles per hour. I'm going to be able to say something about how far the position, what's the position going to do, in particular the change in position in a given time. In one hour, you're going at least 55 miles and less than 75 miles, for example. Okay, so that's the kind of statement we're going to have. That's the kind of intuition we want. If we know something about the velocity, we know something about the position. If we know something about f prime, we know something about f. Okay, so I claim, here's the corollary that I want to get out of this. The claim is that if this is true about the tangent slopes, it's also true about the secant slopes. On any interval where you can apply the mean value theorem, so basically it just has to be continuous and differentiable, the secant slope also has to be bounded in that range as well. And why is that? If not, suppose this weren't true. Well, the actual MVT, the precise version of MVT, says there is a C in AB with F prime of C is equal to this number. But we're assuming it's not in this interval between n and m. But wait, we're assuming that all those derivative numbers are in there. So this just is fairly simple. If the MVT says you can always find a, a tangent slope, an instantaneous rate of change, to match any given secant slope, then if you know something about where the tangent slopes could possibly be, the secant slopes have to be in that range also or else you're going to be able to find a tangent slope that matches this secant slope that's not in the range. Okay, so in other words, in terms of velocities, if your speedometer always reads between 55 and 75 miles per hour, then any average speed calculation, any overall speed calculation you're going to get is also between 55 and 75 miles per hour. You're going to be pretty surprised if somebody says their speedometer was always between 55 and 75, and you realize they went 300 miles in one hour. There's going to be something wrong with that.
Okay. So that's a nice corollary that's about inequalities but and not about focusing on finding exact Cs. So let me just summarize that. If um, f prime of x is always less than two, these two fixed numbers on a, b, then, so this is the corollary of m, v, t. And so if the derivatives are always in this range, then all secant slopes are, uh, can you hear the background noise? It's recorded for posterity. Okay. Um, the secant slopes are always in this region as well. Okay, so here is a special case, which is really nice. It's where n equals minus m. And we can tighten that, just have the notation up a little bit. If the size of the derivative, just the magnitude, strip off the sign, the absolute value of the derivative is less than or equal to m, then any secant slope that's also between minus m and m, or in other words, the absolute value of that is also less than or equal to m. Okay, so let me show you how to use that. Let me use both the corollaries. Okay, so for example, uh, e.g., for example, let's suppose f of one equals is known to be seven, and I know that the slope is always between two and five, or let's say, on the interval, just on the interval one to four. Okay, and this is this always exists on this interval as well. It's always continuous and differentiable and so we've got these this information about the tangent slopes and we want to use that to say let's see the question is what can we say about f of 4 well we know it started out at height 7 we know it can't be super steep can't be bigger than slope 5 but it can't be less than slope 2 so it's going to go out in this range, and so that should tell us something about the possible values it can have when x equals 4. Okay, so we're just going to take the equation, the inequality, f of 4 minus f of 1 over 4 minus 1. Those are, that's the secant slope. We know it's bounded between 2 and 5. Just multiply by 3 everywhere. 6, f of 4 minus f of 1 is between 6 and 15. But f of 1 is known to be 7, and I'm just going to add 7. So I've got to be at at least 13 and less than or equal to 22. Okay. So that's an example of how to use that corollary, that we can predict some function values given information about slopes. And it's actually pretty profound that we can do that, and we have a theorem that says really precisely we can do that. Okay. Now here's an even more special case. we're going to use m equals 0. That's pretty special, OK? In other words, if we have the absolute pro value of f of x less than or equal to 0, whoa, there's only one number whose absolute value is less than or equal to 0. In other words, what we're doing is we're assuming that the slope is equal to 0 everywhere on a, b. And it always exists. It's continuous differentiable. I'm not trying to, we're not trying to trick here, OK? Then, well, we've known for a long time intuitively what's supposed to happen here. If the slope is everywhere 0 on an interval, the function's supposed to be constant. But before the mean value theorem, we didn't actually have a precise thing that really guaranteed that. Um, but that's what it says now. Then, let's just see what the corollary says. It says f of b minus f of a over b minus a. The size of that is less than or equal to 0. Well, again, this is a non-negative number, the only way it can be less than or equal to 0 is if it's equal to 0. And so f of b minus f of a is 0, and f of a equals f of b. It didn't matter what a and b we, ch we picked, though. Whatever a and b we pick, we've shown that it has the same values at those two points.
We could have picked this point and this point, this point and this point, this point and this point. They're all equal. And so f is a constant. Okay. It's one of those things that's more exciting to mathematicians uh, than to non-mathematicians because it's like, yeah, w w once we had some intuition for the derivative, we knew this was true, but this is how people prove it. Okay. Now, why is that? Why, do, why are we making such a big deal out of this special case? Because it actually really has relevance to us, to a question that we asked a little while ago about antiderivatives. Okay. Suppose we have two functions. We don't know the functions yet, but we know that their derivatives are exactly equal. And this is the kind of case we had when we have some function, for example, you know, f prime equals x squared. And we had this assertion that, oh, f of x, it could be 1 third x cubed. Oh, then we figured out it could be that plus a constant. But how do we know that there isn't some clever formula that when we take derivatives, it all magically cancels out? And it has maybe the formula that you start with for f has all kinds of crazy stuff, like arc sines of logs or something like that. Maybe it all cancels out and just gives x squared. How do we know this is every possibility? Well, let's see. What we do is we assume we have two functions, f and g. Here's one of them, maybe, and then some other really random thing. And we just know that their derivatives are equal. So we're taking, trying to find two different antiderivatives of the same function. How different can they be? Hmm. Well, let's just rewrite that. It's f prime minus g prime equals 0. Or we know the derivative of a, of a difference is the difference of the derivative. So we can write that as f minus g prime equals 0. Oh, we just figured out if this is equal to 0 always, not just at some point, but if we know if the derivative is the 0 function, you never have any non-zero slope, then we know that f minus g is a constant. Oh, hey, so f is g plus c. They can only at most differ by a constant. Okay? And that is why we only ever have to do this when we're doing antiderivatives. We can we find any one antiderivative, and then we just say, okay, we're going to add a constant. Um, and so that's that is a really big deal, that we're going to see we see antiderivatives as being incredibly important to this course. And it's really nice to know that yeah, we have to put the plus c, but that's all we ever have to do. So that's a tour of why we care about the mean value theorem.